Hey everybody, Adam Savage. In one of my happiest places, I am at Prop Store down in Los Angeles with Brandon Allinger. Adam, welcome back, good to see you. It's good to see you, man. We have some fun toys to cover today. We do, yeah, we have a big auction coming up in March, March 12th to 14th, of about 1,700 items. We're gonna be selling over three days and some fantastic pieces in there. You've got some really amazing collections in this auction. Yeah, and what gets us really excited, and probably yourself as well, is things that we have not seen before. Yes, yeah, things exactly. that are brand new, fresh to market, and some great pieces have come in for this one, including this, this is, piece right here. This blew my mind. The moment I opened the catalog and saw this, I was like, we got to, we got to talk about this. Uh, tell me about this piece. I mean, as far as I know, collectors have not seen this, and even people that worked on the film have not seen this since production wrapped. This is the lobster spinner from Blade Runner. And this uh, is a background shooting model. Yes, but one of the actual true spinners uh, used as multiple vehicles in the film. They had a couple different paint jobs on it. At one time it was yellow. You can see some yellow oh, hiding there. Oh, okay, so that's not a paint job. That's actually an artifact of I its think so. previous. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and built by someone who I think you know, Mr. Bill George. Bill George is, uh, uh, I worked for him at Industrial Light and Magic. I worked with him over there. He is an amazing effects supervisor and was an incredible model maker. Yeah. There's shots of him working on all sorts of parts of Blade Runner. You told me that he hadn't seen this in 40 years. I sent him a picture of it and he kind of freaked <laughs> out. I think he loves seeing it. He actually just built a replica of it himself a couple of years ago uh, because nobody had seen the original. And I think, you know, the photos, even the reference that existed was just the production photo. Photos yeah. that, that those guys had from the time. It um, is it is really fun to see to see this stuff up close. I'd like to highlight a few things that I please. notice. Um, first up, uh, uh, there's a, a architectural modeling system made by a company called Plastruct. Um, shallow domes, whenever you see them on Star Wars models, they're often Plastruct. And there are four pieces here in this engine part that are Plastruct pipe hangers. Okay. Uh, that I recognize. I just always love seeing the pieces that I know. I know these are radiators from a military kit. That's a gun I know I've used. I mean, most of these parts have shown up in, in models. He's using a, a real murderer's row of, of military kits for this. But the other thing that I really love about this is it's a static model, but he's built in a bunch of movement to it. And I want to explain. One thing is this thing here. This doesn't move but Bill intended that it looks like it does, mm, that yep. somehow it releases at some point. And by the same token, these two front lobster claws, they also don't move, but in putting this tooth belt around, he's giving the impression that there are other states this can go in. And it, even yeah. this spring compression here, this thing has lots of potential movement being, cal being uh, transmitted. And it makes it feel real. Yeah. Yeah, even though you may not be thinking about that when you're seeing it, subconsciously it feels real. Yeah. Right? Um, I also, the paint job is beautiful. This white scoring on the back here where the engine comes out is really lovely in relation to the rest of the sort of coppery, almost wood-like finish. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, one of the things that we love about this piece when it came in is this is exactly how the production left it. So it still has the mounting post there. Yes! And I would suspect that the, mount, the model shop guys mounted this up on this base at the time of production, but that's the original post. And then even the wiring coming out of the back, I mean, that's the original electronic harness wow. and we we sent it to one of our restoration guys who was able to hook the lights up and they work they work and because it's all sealed you know there's no way to open this so we oh. can't change them for LEDs <laughs> right. so what we did it's just on a little momentary switch and oh so you, you can, can light them, them up and see just them just for just for a couple of seconds oh that's and great. hopefully not burn out the 40 year old bulbs wow i and the other part of this is this was made for display. I can see this is painted over enamel on wood on the base here. And this beautiful title card and signature from Harrison Ford. Yeah, which Th is clearly it was done like this like a, only a year or so after production. A story in themselves. I mean, my guess is, I don't know if we know exactly, but my guess is this must have been on display as part of a premiere right. or an exhibition promoting yep. the making of the film or something. Well, and that if we want to talk about time. how early it is, it's hilarious. Built by Bill George, who currently works for filmmaker George Lucas, as opposed to the other George Lucas. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And maybe a typo in Sid Mead's name there. Uh, is it oh, M -E -A -D? oh. We'll, we'll forgive them. We'll forgive them. We'll forgive them. <laughs> but yeah, typewritten and still in its original vitrine. Yeah. With Harrison Ford's signature. And and that probably dates it more than anything because Harrison Ford's signature today does not look like that. You know? Oh, really? Well, in this signature, you've kind of got every letter of the name. Today, it's sort of an H and an F and maybe a couple squiggles in between. So he's uh, he's he's refined the technique. How many, how many signatures has Harrison Ford signed <laughs> at this point? Many millions, I think. Yeah, so. the extra 
the extra narrative of this being dressed up for, for, for a display and all of that still being extant, it is like this was put somewhere and nobody's touched it for 40 years. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, this, the story was that it was given away in a contest at the time. Really? Um, and the, the, the gentleman who's owned it for a number of years, he got it for a number of collectors. So we had never even had whisper that this piece was still in existence, that it was out there. Wow. That's the most fun. Because, you know, sometimes you hear things, oh, that is out there somewhere. Somebody has that. You yeah. just don't know who. We had never heard of this piece existing. So um, did a phone call come in and you were like, no. Yeah, an email came in. Yeah. And look, that's one of the most fun things. I was going to say, you must get do. this like fever at a certain point. You're like, could it be? Is it? Will? And then it's the... actually a two step process. Because okay. first you get the you get the initial contact. But then the big question is just, is this real or is it right. nothing? Because we do get a lot. Because you visited be a lot of places where it's like, oh, no. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We get a lot of Don Post Stormtrooper helmets that are offered up. As, sure. And so you're sort of waiting for that picture. And then it's, uh, you know. <laughs> but this one was, whoa, look at that. You yeah. Know? Um, so really cool. Much the same way. Remember the costume that we had last year? It's the same thing. It was, we had never heard of it being out there. A guy wrote in and said, I have this. We said, send us pictures. And the pictures came in. We said, that's Holy it. Holy cow. You know? Amazing. It's it's an amazing piece. And I, I, again, I, I, I'm so, I love the way it's displayed. You guys do a wonderful job at display. It actually must be nice to take a vacation for a piece like this. <laughs> it is, yeah, it's ready to go. And for a collector too, you know, it's because this is all original to it and from the time you would never want to change this. No. I think it, it's got to live like this forever now. A hundred percent. But, you know, the other thing that's really uh, significant about this, in my opinion, is you actually see it in the op maybe the opening shot, certainly the opening sequence of the film. It's the first spinner that sort of flies. It is the first spinner that hands. flies through the Hades landscape. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. How cool is that? That is, that's crazy. And speak, actually, that's a beautiful transition to some of these pieces. That, that, that is the sort of, when you, when you talk within special effects about that opening sequence, everyone calls it the Hades sequence. Yeah. Uh, flying through Los Angeles 2019. Tell me about what these are. So this is some of the etch brash that they, they made in bulk, in quantity, for those model cityscapes. Um, and, you know, we've had a few pieces like this in the past. Obviously, this is from the city. I'm not sure. What do you think? I think is? this is some, this looks to me, the Egyptian uh, the, geometry makes me think it's part of the Tyrell building yeah. brass. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and so for the Haiti sequence to create scale, they were just putting pieces of black painted brass just in camera at depth, so, and it transmitted all of this crazy detail because it's so fine. Yeah, but somehow these pieces, you know, even without knowing what they're from, the aesthetic of Blade Runner is totally in there. It's right? completely clear. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. really is. And you can see, I mean, all of this, all of these patterns were done by hand back then. Yeah. This was someone with a pen transmitting this to a brass etching company. And how does the etching process work? You must know. Uh, so you you create a pattern which is a light resist. So it's always binary, black and white, and mm -hmm. you etch one or the other. Actually communicating to your brass etcher what is getting etched and what is okay. not. What is, stays and what goes. Is often okay. very, very fraught a yeah. discussion. Uh, but yeah, you make, a, you make a pattern and then that pattern gets exposed onto a resist onto the brass where it can be washed off and then they etch what remains. It's effectively not dissimilar from printing, except with acids instead of inks going where the voids are. And do you think people are still using that technique in modern Absolutely. Yeah. And I have still, I have ordered etched brass in the last five years okay. from companies that yeah. still do it. There, there, are le there are lasers that are now doing this at a, at a fineness that are lovely. But As opposed to what, chemical process? Yeah, so the, yeah. This, is, this etching has always been a chemical process yeah. where you use an acid to eat away uh, wherever you haven't painted the brass. Okay. But now I think we're getting closer and closer to lasers being able to do this way faster and cheaper. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I think Return of the Jedi did a lot with etched brass. Return also. of the Jedi right. has tons. There's tons on the um, on the Death Star under construction, yeah. bits of makes that. Sense. And then also uh, in Alien on the spacesuit, all those hieroglyphs on the helmet ah, are actually okay. done in etched brass. And they show up in several other Alien props. Yeah. So someone could build a whole collection of etch brass from different films. I you know, actually the Alien etch brass, the Star Wars etch brass, the Blade Runner etch. I have a whole shelf <laughs> of just etch brass okay. from The Martian, yeah. from Blade Runner, from Ghostbusters, from yeah, yeah. yeah Fun exactly. because it's subtle, but if you know it, you, you well, know and it again, for this kind of detail, there was for, forever there was no technique that could get you that level of detail at scale. Mm -hmm. um, that Tyrell building, you know, the cameras pushing into it is only inches away. Right. And that's why you, we have to go to that level of detail because anything less is going to 
look gigantic. It's going to fall apart. Yeah. 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 That's, this is, is this the most amount of brass from Blade Runner you've had in the? Maybe. Yeah. We've, yeah. Had, we've had a couple of other collections come in the past from folks that worked on the film. So I do think it was kind of a souvenir of the day, mm -hmm. much in the way that Death Star surface pieces were for right. model makers right. and ILM. Just like candy to give out. Yeah. But, and it's because it's recognizable. And so yeah. it's a fun keepsake. You know, you can very easily put it on a shelf or in a frame on a wall. Well, I want to, of course, I want to put it up with little LEDs on it. Right, well you can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> Call me, I will help, I'll help with the display. I might be expensive, but I still would have a lot of fun. And, and I love how the aesthetic of this, this sort of, you know, thin wires and plumbing, whatever that might be, then ties right into some of what we see in the matte painting. This is, this is one of the pieces I was most excited about in the catalog. Matte paintings often show, I'm, I'm always talking in movies about uh, you can't make everything perfect, so the goal is to make it good enough for camera. And matte painting is the sort of amazing object lesson in good enough for camera. Yeah. Because they sell to us so completely when we're watching the movie. And when you look at them up close, there's there's so much sort of softness in the detail. This is, this is Harrison Ford hangs above this at the end. Yeah, I mean, this has got to be one of the most memorable shots from the film. You know, literally when he's hanging off the building in that final confrontation with Roy Batty. Yeah. And, you know, we've never seen this painting before either. This is done by a very famous matte artist named Matthew Yurisich, okay. who worked at MGM and Fox Studios in like the 1950s and worked on, you know, classic films like Forbidden Planet. Um, and, and, and he was still working through the 70s and 80s. He worked a lot with Doug Trumbull and then Richard Edlund. Mm -hmm. So Close Encounters, Blade Runner, yeah. uh, uh, Ghostbusters. A lot of our favorite films have Matthew Yurisich matte paintings in them. Uh, looking at it up close, it betrays this incredible understanding of what is necessary to communicate the drama of the shot. Meaning, mm. don't overdo it. Don't right? overdo it. I mean, as like when the camera comes in for B-roll, which they're probably watching right now, and you get to see how it's not like he's painted a photorealistic scene, but he has included kicks of light that from even a short distance makes it feel photorealistic. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, you know, having read about matte paintings, one of the things I've seen people say is, it, it, if it's too realistic, it actually works against you. Right. It's, and it's part, the softness helps pull the image together with the live action. And it's that thing of like, you're not supposed to pay attention to it. You're right. supposed to go, oh, that's the background, the background. and let it go. Yeah. And in a way, it's asking you to do that with this like, oh, this is just a gesture of light, a gesture of a, of a piece. And, and the other thing that is kind of a story with this particular painting and several others like it is, because of the compositing process they were using on Blade Runner, the colors all shifted. So this is not the color scheme as oh, you'll see it in the film. Okay. They have to kind of paint it for the final version. So they have to understand to say like a brown is gonna shift to be more blue. Oh my gosh. And they have to do all that in their head as today you do it in Photoshop, it'd be a very easy change. But then they had to understand the photochemical process and what it was gonna look like in the final. So that to me is one of the most impressive things is like how can you paint in a different color palette, different hues, and know that it's going to line up and exactly. work at the end. Pretty fascinating. That is really fascinating. Also, out here at the edges where it gets really soft and spongy feels like, again, it, it, like most of special effects, it feels somewhat like a magic trick. Yes, and, and it is. And, you know, what's great about this as a physical artifact is that it's a magic trick that will not be performed again. I mean, you know, they're not doing this anymore. Today, right. it's digital. It's just there is no physical matte painting ever in 2024 and beyond, you know, and, so this and, is a real relic. So just to walk through so the audience really understands, Harrison was filmed hanging from a beam in a soundstage and he had blue screen below him. And then this was shot and composited in the frame, matching the line of the building he's hanging from and composited onto the blue screen. Yeah. Yeah, it's just amazing, amazing. It really and, is. And, and it, again, this is all, everyone plotting out exactly how that shot's gonna work. They had shot Harrison, I'm sure, before they painted this. Yeah. So they knew what to fill in the frame. And there's actually a couple of different shots in the movie that use, you know, all the same setup. Yeah. But, you know, they, they show forward, and then they cut back to Batty, and then they cut back again. And, and it's slightly different each time because they're changing the lighting. Oh. And, the, and at some point they drop a little miniature car over here. Oh. And I don't know how that works. I don't know if that's composited in also. Or, or they just put a matchbox car on the maybe, actual painting. Right? <laughs> and shot it that way. Just shoot yeah. it down, right? Um, but really just effective and impressive. And also immediately 
Blade Runner. You know, you look at it yeah. and you go, oh, I know what that is. I mean, so I also want to talk as a model maker, uh, you know, we were talking about Bill George's thing. You're asked to solve aesthetic problems and many of them are not even ones you're discussing with the art director, right? They're like, we ask you to build this model, solve those problems. And so you do, right? You go into this sort of open space where you're doing your own creativity. But the idea of actually creating this street scene where this is a whole narrative of this street. This had to be a part of a lot of discussions about what the form of it was and how the light would spill in here. And then this painter spends however much time, a week or two, yeah. delivering this. That is an incredible amount of aesthetic trust that one person has to deliver this, right. this piece. But I guess that reflects the whole filmmaking process. I mean, the director can't call out everything. Indeed, right? indeed, yeah. Um, it's. I, nothing makes me happier than looking at matte paintings up close because you're like, oh, what's that detail? Oh, it is a splotch of blue next to a splotch of white. I also <laughs> love these little tech notes over here, which I don't know exactly what that means. Maybe. FX 97. I mean, that's probably the shot, right? Yeah, yeah. And then V shot and H. names. Yeah. V so, Something about how they're shooting it. Angles or I'm eight, not sure V exactly. equals 83 and a half. Maybe inches camera is from, mm, from yeah. the piece. I love Blade Runner. Yeah. Number eight, yeah. All of those artifacts of the piece around the periphery are lovely. And how they've blocked off the frame with just, you know, gaffer's tape. Yeah. And it's just, uh, you know, this one's on board and that's a, sort of a story too. Sometimes matte painting's on board, sometimes, sometimes on, on glass, glass. Right? yeah. Nice thing about on board is it's not gonna shatter. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, that must be terrifying for you guys. That hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> yeah, we do, we do get glass ones sometimes, especially shipping them. It's. Um, you know, there's there's a couple of uh, infamous map painting stories where famous map paintings have been lost in transit, glass map paintings. So uh, the nice thing about a, a board one is that they're hardy and they're going to be here for many years to come. My father had in his collection um, a fully painted um, evil queen from Snow White from Disney cell animation oh, wow. of the evil queen where the ink was done in red in like three different colors on the dress and literally spilled acetone on it. Oh, I mean, it just, it was a complete destruction. Yikes. Yeah. Paint remover. <laughs> but does that mean you're from a family of collectors? I don't yeah, think I knew that. To a certain extent. Yes. Yeah. Okay. My dad's studio was not full of necessarily precious artifacts, but it was full of beautiful and compelling things. Okay. And was uh, that influential to you? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, the, um, there's a German word uh, for a, a cabinet of curiosities that you're supposed to touch, and it's Wunderkammer. And I've come to embrace that as my aesthetic about a space. I want every, I, and I know like we walk around, we touch the stuff with white gloves. In my space particularly, I want everyone touching everything because yeah. I like that tactility. That was definitely part of my dad's studio. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. There's, there's a connection that comes from yeah. holding something that you don't get looking at in person or especially looking at it in a book or catalog or something. Well, and it, there's also this aspect of when you have stuff on the walls that people made and you get to see their techniques, right? Look, looking at the cell, I grew up looking at the cell and I looked at it from back the behind. I was an assistant animator, I painted cells. So I had enough knowledge to see how incredible this work was. Uh, and by the same token, like, Getting to see this thing up close tells you about the brilliance of the people helping the filmmaker realize their vision that yeah. you wouldn't see in any right. other circumstance. You certainly wouldn't see it in the film. Right? No. It makes it real. It's a peek behind the curtain. And and like I'm looking at a, I, I feel like as I walk my eyes over this, I'm seeing a shot from Blade Runner that I had not seen before, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, <laughs> and that's, look, that's what we love so much about everything that we do here at Prop Store. So much of the fun is getting to see or appreciate some aspect of an artifact that you didn't take away from the film. You right, know? right. In the film, you might see that, but you're not seeing it well. You're not able to study it as you are here today. Yeah, and again, it's all that thing of when everyone's done their job, all of their jobs disappear. It is, that's part of, that's the magic trick that happens. So this disappears into the Haiti sequence. You don't realize that these are sheets of paper thin brass or that this is a really loosey goosey painting, not as realistic as you expect. That's um, somehow that always makes me, it feels like a hug. It feels like a, I'm yeah. a, a, an embrace of craftspersonship. Right. It's almost not drawing too much attention to itself. Yeah. It's just supporting the overall vision. 
Uh, there are, you said, over 1,800 pieces in this auction? 1,700. 1,700 yeah, pieces in this auction. Yeah. So this is just three of them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to shoot some more videos. We've got some other stuff to cover in this room, as you've probably seen as Joey's moving about. Brendan, thank you so much. Good to see Every you. Every time I come, I get a new piece of education in my understanding of film. I thought you might like these. Yeah. When these came in, I thought they'd be for you. That's great. Thanks for watching that video. Your support allows us to make more of this great content. And if you'd like to help us further, help tested.merch.com? Uh, tested store.com. Tested-store.com. Head over to our merch store, tested. What is it? Tested-store.com. Tested-store.com. Head over to our store at tested store. Doctor, I can't even read what I wrote. Tested. Dash. Dash. Type in dash and dash. There we go. <laughs> I had to start that again. <laughs> All right, here we go. Tested-store.com. Tested-store.com.